Good morning. Thanks for coming today. I want to welcome you, welcome everyone in the chapel, everyone at Chaska, of course, and everyone watching online today. You know, I want to just give you a little update before we jump into Judges chapter 10 today. You know, our fall kickoff just, just happened just a, a few short weeks ago, and man, it, is, it was a smashing success in large part due to, due to you, to your service, and also your attendance. And so in our children's ministry and our student ministry, we are like seeing like peak levels in engagement. Also in, in the men's and women's ministry, man, it's just amazing to see how people have responded. So check this out. In men's ministry, we had 809 men sign up for a Bible study to get in the word. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing. Uh, now, the, now, the women, a little bit better. The women had, listen to this, the women had 1,100 women show up for Bible study. So, you can pray for us. There's some bad blood brewing right now, like on our team, on our staff. You know, Bob Coffin, our men's pastor, is always trying to win. It's always trying to win. And so he's like, well, whatever Sherry has in women's Bible study, I got six more. Whatever that number is, I got six more. So how amazing is that though? I mean, almost 2,000 people, men and women, who've signed up to be in God's word on a consistent basis. That's a beautiful, beautiful thing, amen? And so we celebrate God's work, amen. Well, you know, after, uh, after walking through the book of Judges for you know, the, the last nine weeks or so, I've kind of gotten accustomed to, maybe even conditioned to, kind of expecting some big time drama every single week. I mean, the storylines and Judges are just absolutely like mind blowing. And so there's hype, there's surprise, there's intrigue, there's chaos, there's war, there's murder, there's miracles, there's millstones, like like repeat, replete in every single chapter. And as I considered that, I thought, you know, it'd be nice to get some normal every once in a while, wouldn't it? Like just no hype and, and no drama, just a little calm, a little peace and quiet. And I'm sure we can all relate. Well, today we're actually going to get some normalcy from a pair of minor judges named Tola and Jair, two two brothers you've probably never heard anything at all about. And so the judgeship of Tola spanned 23 years, and during his tenure, check this out, there was no report of idolatry or rebellion or apostasy on the part of Israel. Everything was smooth, quiet, and calm. Now, we do know that Tola's name means worm. That's an awful name, right? It means worm, but other than that, little space is actually devoted to Tola's life and his service. Like, no enemy is, is even highlighted during his, his leadership era. He just lived a peaceful, faithful, quiet Life. Obviously, he stands in stark contrast to the crazy vill that Abimelech unleashed into people's lives in chapter 9. So if you missed last weekend's message, go back and listen to it. It'll make everything kind of make sense moving forward. Well, similar in duration, Jair, whose name means may God enlighten, judged Israel for, for 22 years. And the text says in verse four that he had 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys and they had 30 cities. Kind of a bizarre description. 30 sons who rode 30 donkeys and they had 30 cities. That's a lot of sons, a lot of donkeys, a lot of cleanup, and a lot of real estate. And by the way, just so you know, if you owned a donkey in that era, you had it going on. So this was a well-to-do family committed to regional political stability. However, after Jair died, like you, you know the drill. Like you've heard the series long enough, you know the drill. Look in verse six. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And then look at how the wheels came off here. Check this out. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord and they served the Baals. Now check out the list here. The Baals, the Ashtaroth, the gods of Syria, the gods of Sidon, the gods of Moab, the gods of the Ammonites, and the gods of the Philistines. They pretty much imploded at this point. Rather than embracing and changing culture through their their God-given heritage as his people, man, they literally succumbed to the cultural pressure and became just like everyone around them. 
And so here's kind of the, the theme that you see. Whenever there is a vacuum in leadership, the wheels would come off for the Israelites. And so we see it once again, the Israelites racing towards the sin of idolatry. They forsook the Lord and sold themselves out to literally seven different gods, kind of hedging their bets. We're just going to try to worship all of them together. And then their sinfulness led to their bondage. By the way, sinfulness always leads to bondage. Look in verses seven to nine. And so the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the Ammonites. And they crushed, verse eight, and oppressed the people of Israel that year. And then check this out. For 18 years, they oppressed all the people of Israel who were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead, then verse nine. And the Ammonites crossed the Jordan to fight also against Judah and against Benjamin and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was severely distressed. And it was, that, it was that pressure, it was that distress, it was that, that, that moment in time where they just felt like the weight of the world was coming down on them that kind of pushed Israel to say, we're sorry, we're sorry. And even though this is the first confession of sin from Israel in the book of Judges, you're going to see it was completely empty, completely shallow, completely meaningless and hollow. Look in verse 10. And the people of Israel cried out to the Lord saying, we sinned against you because we have forsaken our God and have served the Baals. You can kind of hear, it kind of sounds perfunctory, doesn't it? Like they know the right words to say, even though they don't mean it in their hearts. It's almost like they were releasing kind of like a press release to God. Hey, you know, we've, we've messed up. We've sinned. We're really sorry. There's no heart behind it. There's no change within it. And so you see here that they weren't sorry over their sin. They just hated the consequences of God's judgment. And so from the context, it's clear that Israel viewed God as a, as a Mr. Fix-It. Just, just fix it, God, fix it, God, instead of asking God to fix them. And so in verse 11, God outs them for playing around. He outs them for playing games. Look at verse 11. And the Lord said to the people of Israel, did I not save you? From the Egyptians, from the Amorites, from the Ammonites, from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, the Amalekites and the Mayanites oppressed you, and you cried out to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Essentially, God says, listen, all I've done is save you. At every turn, I've saved you over and over and over again. And yet, what do I get for that? Look at verse, eight, verse 13. You've forsaken me. You've served other gods. Therefore, I will save you no more. And then look what he says in verse 14. He kind of turns up the heat on him here. Go and cry out to the gods whom you've chosen. Let them save you in your time of distress. So God says, listen, y'all want to do this? You can go ahead and do this. Go ahead and let your little G gods do it for you. Let your little G gods bail you out of this mess. Go ahead and run to them now. Go ahead and turn to them now and see how that goes for you. Well, this, this news actually hit the Israelites hard. So much so that in verse 15, they say, God, you're right, we're wrong. And that is at the heart level, the core level of repentance, isn't it? God, you're right, you're right, and I'm wrong. And it comes from a place that's really genuine in our hearts. Look at verse 15. And the people of Israel said to the Lord, we have sinned. And here, look at this. Notice the difference between their initial confession and this one. Do to us whatever seems good to you. Only please deliver us this day. And then here's the key. Here's how you know your confession is legit. You repent. Look in verse 16. So they put away the foreign gods from among them and they served the Lord. And he, God, became impatient over the misery of Israel. So God was going to right, respond to their repentance. But you see here that finally, like their actions matched up with their words and they repented and they served God again. The people then, then cry out, like, like now what? Now, like, now what do we do? You know the vicious cycle. Now what, now what? Who's going to lead us? And so in verses 17 to 18, the stage is essentially being set for Jephthah to emerge as one of Israel's most colorful leaders. And we're going to look at him in chapter 11 next weekend. So let me, let me just kind of summarize briefly this, this chapter for you. Two judges, Tola and Jair live faithful lives of, of quiet service. And Israel experiences 45 years of combined like peace and calm. And God blesses their quiet faithfulness to him. 
However, once these two judges died, Israel once again got pulled away from the one true and living God. And God does what God does. God held them accountable and he disciplined them for their idolatry. Israel then offered up this half-hearted, meaningless, empty, shallow, hey, we're really sorry, God. But God was not fooled by their phony confession. And in the end, it was the searing pain of oppression and discipline and persecution that actually pushed the people to repent of their sin and submit to God. Pretty clean, pretty simple, pretty straightforward. And so as good like Bible students, right, here's what we do. We ask the question, what is God saying, which is interpretation. And then we always ask the question because we want to do what the word says. What is God saying to us, which is application? So let's do that today. Let's, let's turn our attention and focus on what is God saying to us? What do we learn then from chapter 10? Well, the first thing I think we, we learn is that quality leadership. And I want you to think about this. Quality leadership doesn't need to be loud or flashy. I mean, you read about Tola and Jair and they, they led for a combined 45 years and, and probably none of us in this place have even heard their names before. We know very little about them, even from the scriptural text, other than the fact that they led faithful, obedient lives. They, just, they served God without fanfare, but they were just faithful to God. They weren't like big flashy names that ended up in Hebrews chapter 11. Their names weren't in the bright lights. Their tenures were essentially marked by a quiet, faithful obedience. There was no drama with either of them and there was no chaos in Israel either. And you know, I read that and I thought, how refreshing is that to hear? especially in this day and age when we are seeing people in ministry like dropping like flies. Y'all noticing that? You're like, like ministry leaders are crashing and burning at a horrible rate. I, I think we're all still kind of reeling from the whole Ravi Zacharias findings and that darkness and that sinfulness and that sadness and that chaos, which kind of reminds us then that, that the goal in leadership the goal in leadership at home, at work, or in the church should be to make an impact, not make a splash. It should be to make an impact, not, not make a splash. It's like good leaders know how to play the background role while Jesus plays the lead role. And so I've said this before, I'll say it a little differently today. Don't get sucked into this idea that you have to be amazing for God. Here's what I would say. Just calm down and be faithful. Just breathe. You don't have to be awesome. You don't have to be amazing. Take that burden off of your shoulders. Your goal should be this. Make it your goal to help people see how amazing God is, not how amazing you are. Now, I know that's really hard for us to hear because I know, like for all of us, like we've, we've all grown up and you're like, well, my mom said I was awesome. My mom thinks I'm awesome. It's cool that your mom thinks you're awesome. And I'm sure you, to your mother, you're really awesome. So I'm not saying like, you know, hurt your mom's feelings by, hey, my pastor said that I'm not awesome, that God's awesome. I'm not, I'm not saying say that to your mom. I'm just saying you're not awesome, even though your mom thinks you're awesome but be really nice to your mom because the goal is for you not to be awesome. The goal is for you to declare how awesome Jesus is. Amen. And that's a huge, that's a huge relief for us because I think we live in this day and age where I got to do something amazing. I got to be flashy and splashy. I got to make a name for myself. I would say just calm down and breathe. All right. Just calm down and breathe and relax and be faithful. Why isn't faithfulness enough for us? Why isn't a long obedience in the same direction good enough for us? Amen? When people are dropping like flies all over the place, you know what we need? We just need some people that will be quietly faithful to 
the Lord, making a huge deal over the person of Jesus Christ. And if you will do that, God will use you. You won't be a casualty of ministry, but you will what? You will persevere until the end. Amen? Like that's the goal. My goal is to like be faithful, quietly faithful. Just preach and teach the Bible. Don't try to be amazing. Don't try to be a rock star. Don't try to get a bunch of followers. But simply tell people how awesome Jesus Christ is. That's my role. And that's your role too. That's our role as the church of Jesus Christ. And so for you younger leaders, let me just give you a quick word. Those of you 25 and under, I want to encourage you to spend your time developing your inner character more than your outer charisma. Here's what I will tell you about charisma. Charisma will open a lot of doors for you. But if you don't have any character, you won't last. And so here's what I have learned. Character lasts, charisma fizzles. You know that, right? So charisma over time, people finally get tired of the show. They finally get tired of all the inauthenticity. And here's what people want in the end. They just want honest. They just want real. And they just want people who are really authentically trying to follow Jesus and make a big deal over the Savior of the world. Amen? So your goal isn't to make a splash. Your goal is to just faithfully make an impact for the cause of Jesus Christ. Tola and Jair, man, they're a model for ministry in that regard. Just faithful service, faithful service. Number two, I think we learn here from Judges 10 that God is, God is unfazed by insincerity. He's unfazed by insincerity. But let me tell you what God is actually phased by. God is phased by humility. God is phased by brokenness. God is phased by authenticity and honesty. He's phased by people who come clean, not cover up. And so I'm just gonna shoot you straight here. There is absolutely no reason at all for insincerity in your relationship with God. And here's why. God already knows your why. He knows what you do, and he already knows why you do what you do, and he knows your why before you know your why. So, so God knows our heart motives before we know our heart's motives, which means we always have to check the motives of our hearts. And so, like early on, the Israelites, if you look at it, we're honest, they were just users. Like they're just users. Like the Israelites were just users. They were like, listen, hey God, we just want you to fix our broken lives, but not, not deal with our sinful hearts. I mean, think about that. Just be a fixer, God. Just, just, just fix my brokenness, but don't deal with my, my sinfulness. And you're going to see that, that God said no. God said no to that, just being Mr. Fix-It. God said no. And here's why God said no. Essentially, God is saying that if I keep fixing your mess and you never address your biggest need, then nothing changes in your life. And so that's what we do. Like, God, can you fix this? Can you fix this? Can you fix this? And God's like, no, no, no. I need to fix you. Like, let's talk about you. And so let me ask you, because if you come to church for a while, you kind of learn how to say all the right words, sing all the songs. And you can say all the right religious things because you want God to get you out of a jam. And I hope that's not the case. I hope it's this that you're genuinely seeking to be right with God because you just want to be right with God. And you're not trying to get something out of his hands. You're just trying to know him and be in relationship with him. And I would say this, remember, God cannot be fooled by your words. So he, he knows when the confessions are real. He knows when they're bogus. He knows when you're just like saying the line. So you're not fooling anybody, most certainly not even fooling God. So God knows your motives. So be sincere, be honest, be authentic, and be real. Thirdly, I think we learn that from Judges 10, that God wants us to recognize the danger of sin. He wants us to recognize the danger of sin. Obviously, Israel did not get the memo on this one. Because it was sin and confess and sin again. Rinse, wash, and repeat. 
I mean, you see that line over and over and over again. And again, Israel did what was evil in the sight of God. And so this kind of shows us, I want you to think about this. This kind of shows us there's a, uh, there's a sort of uh, uh, a spiritual insanity about sin. Like it makes no logical sense to us. Like it makes no logical sense to keep repeating behaviors that lead you into bondage. Like why would you keep repeating the same behaviors over and over and over again when you know the playbook? Here's the playbook. If you continually race towards idolatry, God's going to hold you accountable and he's going to raise up, if you're the Israelites, another nation to oppress you and push on you and squeeze on you until you repent of your sins. Why not learn your lesson then about sin so you don't have to go through that over and over and over again? And so I think, man, you, you think how that applies to our lives. You think we would kind of get that lesson at some point. To which I would say this, it doesn't really matter how smart you are or how spiritually mature you perceive yourself to be. Anyone who is separated from God by sin is also separated from reality. You're separated from reality. And I hope you'll take this to heart. It is impossible to see things clearly. It is impossible to think rightly about matters and issues when you are stuck in sin. So think of it like this. Sin is like a drug that paralyzes the will. And it can take a really, really long time for the victim to realize it. That's the story of the Israelites. The besetting sin of idolatry ruled their existence. And so God is trying to, to lead them to the place like, stop playing around with sin. Don't you see the effects and the danger of sin? And yet again and again, it was once again, the Israelites did evil in the sight of the Lord. And so can I do this? Can I spend like five minutes, just give me five minutes telling you why God hates sin. Just five minutes telling you why God hates sin. Number one, God hates sin because sin separates us from him. Look at Isaiah 59 too, look what it says. But your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. Sin always brings alienation and separation. And the fact, and there is good news in this, and the fact that God hates sin means, if you think big picture here, means that God hates being separated from those that he loves. And so I want you to hear this. God doesn't want to be separated from you. It's why he sent Jesus Christ to come and die on a cross to take away your sins. So God made a provision so you never have to be separated from God again. And that provision is the cross of Jesus Christ. And so rather than like, I have to live with this separation where something's really off between me and God. No, no, no. You can actually draw close to God. And you draw close to God by trusting in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? Like God, God loves you that much. He doesn't want that separation to exist between the two of you. Number two, God hates sin because sin excludes us from God's blessings. Now, one of the things that, that occasionally is probably good for me to do, uh, I'm always kind of like a up in your face, trying to challenge everybody, try to push everybody. And every now and then, I probably need to calm down and breathe myself like I get that. And so one of the things that, I, that I've done is I've kind of gone back and looked at like the last seven or eight months of my preaching and teaching. And I want to make sure that I'm, that I'm clearly and consistently telling you that God loves you and that God really wants to bless you. I hope you hear that coming from me, coming from this platform. God really wants to bless your life. And if I don't say that enough, man, I'm sorry, because I want to say it where you really understand that God does love you. He sent Jesus to die for you. And God wants to bless your life. He really does. So those who have their sins forgiven can say, Psalm 1611, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. There's the fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is a life that is actually an option for you if you're a follower of Jesus Christ. And so in that way, to pursue sin is to turn your back on God 
and on the blessing of God. So, so please hear me. God will not fund or bless a sinful lifestyle. He won't. But God desires to bless his people. So when, when my uh, two oldest daughters and then my son went away to college, I said to them, listen to me. I will not, as your father, I will not fund sin. So if you want to go do your thing, then I will cut off the cash, which is great incentive to get them to live godly and pure lives, isn't it? <laughs> right? I don't want to fund your sin. Like no parent is going, yeah, 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 let me just keep writing the checks while you keep doing that sinful thing. God is not going to bless sin. God doesn't fund a sinful lifestyle any more than a parent would do that with his or her children. And then number three, God hates sin because sin actually blinds us to the truth. I want you to hear this. Sin, sin keeps us from the truth about God. Sin keeps us from the truth about ourselves. And sin keeps us from the truth about our need for the person of Jesus Christ. You, you just can't see it clearly. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says this. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And so the enemy is trying to keep you blinded, trying to keep you in the dark. The enemy does not want you to see the truth about who God is. The enemy doesn't want you to see the truth about who you are. And the enemy does not want you to see the truth about your need for the person of Jesus Christ. That's why God has intervened. God wants you to see the truth. God wants you to know the truth. God wants you to hear the truth. That's how much God loves you. He wants for you to see the truth. And then number four, God hates sin because sin enslaves us and will, the Bible says, will eventually destroy us. Romans 6, 16 says this. Do you not know that if, if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves, and I want you to underline this, this line here, this thought here. You are slaves of the one whom you obey. You are slaves of the one whom you obey. Ba that's ba Batman is leaving the building. That's my little grandson, Jax, and he's Batman today. Ba hey, Batman, can you turn around and wave to us, Batman? Come over here, come here, come here. He wanted me to enter. Come here, run over here. He, 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 he barely hang on. Come over here, Batman. Watch where you're going, man. He got some new glasses, so he's struggling to see a little bit here. This is Batman, everybody, right here. Can you wave, can you wave to everybody? You wave to your friends down there? Where's your Batman glove? I took it off. You took it off? Okay. All right. So you learning, you learning today in church? Yeah. A little bit? Oh, you, oh, you're learning about it? Oh, you're going crazy today? All right, you wanted me to introduce you, so do you say hi to everybody? Just wave to them, and you got to go. Tell them, tell them bye. All right, that's good. All right. All right, now run out of here and, and don't trip and fall. Okay, bye, Batman. He goes, he goes, you're Captain America, and I'm Batman. <laughs> so we went to the Mall of America last night, and I got a couple items, and he's like, do you have, do you have Captain America's shield in that bag? I'm like, yeah, it's in the bag. I got the shield in the bag. Can I see the shield? You can't see it. Captain America's on the down low, okay? So keep it real here. So yeah, I saw him and he wanted me to introduce, I forgot to introduce him. He has Batman glove on, he wanted you to see him. But listen, don't we wanna teach our children, man, like who Christ is? The last thing, think about it, how much we love our children. So I thought about that. You would never want them to be blinded to the truth of who God is. You never want them to be blinded to the truth of who they are or their need for Jesus Christ. That's how much God loves us. I want you to know the truth. I want you to know the truth. The enemy is trying to blind you and keep you from the gospel. And Jesus, man, he has done everything in his power to bring the gospel to us so we can be saved. Amen? And so here's what you need to know, man. You're a slave to whom you obey. You really are. And then look what it says. Either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. So let me translate it in English, okay? Paul says, you're either a slave to sin. So if you obey sin, then you're a slave to sin. And if you're a slave to sin, the outcome of being a slave to sin is always death. 
or you are a slave to obedience. If you're a slave to obedience, when you're a slave to obedience, the one to whom you obey is obedience, then the end game in that, the result of that is righteousness and life. We know Romans 6, 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So the penalty of sin, the payout for sin is always death. And so God hates sin because God hates death. God hates death because God is all about life. He's all about life. And yet we, we, are, we are just like the Israelites in so many ways. They, they wanted God to fix their problems, but not fix them. How often is that true of us? They wanted God to bless them, but not address their sin. They wanted God to, to clean up their mess, but not mess with their hearts. And, and I would say this, it's not until we finally like despise our sins that we'll be ready for a genuine work of God in our lives. Like it's not until we realize that God wants to change us, not just our circumstances, that we'll be ready for serious change. And I see a lot of people who do that. Just change my circumstances, change my situation, change my relationships. And God's like, no, 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 I want to change you. I want to change you. You want me to change everything around you when the one thing that really needs changed is you. And so know this, man. God hates sin because he is perfectly pure and holy. And God hates sin because of the harm and death it unleashes into the lives of people that God genuinely loves. And because God loves us so much, God is actually willing to forgive all of our sins when we place faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ. And so I want you to hear me. God wants to fix you, not just your problems. Amen? Amen. So we gotta open, we gotta open ourselves up to that. And so here's what I wanna do, two things. Number one, I wanna, if you're a Christ, I wanna just give you a moment to like genuinely sit before the Lord and assess the way you confess. Like, is it, is it genuine? Is it real? Is it authentic? Or are you just like kind of making religious statements all the time and you're really not right in your heart with God? So I'm gonna just give you a moment here. We're gonna take a moment here and we're gonna just pause. We're gonna be quiet. And I wanna just encourage you Say, God, I want to be authentic before you. I want to be genuine before you. I want to be honest before you. I want to be real. And I want to come clean. And I want you to assess the way I confess, God. Because God knows your why. God knows your motives. God knows if it's like, hey, just, just, just fix this, but don't mess with me. So come, come clean with that today. So let's take a few moments then. Just bow together if you would. I just want to give you a moment between you and Christ right here where you lay your heart bare before him and you confess your sin to him and practice being honest in his presence, genuine and honest in his presence. God, I pray today you'd help us to despise our sins in order to prepare us for a genuine work of God. Help us to see today that it's not until we realize that you want to change us, not just our circumstances, that we'll be ready for serious change. And so would you bring, would you bring that change to us today? Help us to see that you hate sin, not because you're a hater, but because you love us and you hate 
how sin ravages our lives. And God, all, all of us today who are struggling with a besetting sin, where we confess, then we sin, then we confess again, would you bring that to a halt today? Whether it be lust or pride or arrogance, pornography, impure, whatever it is that we just keep like delving back into sin over and over again. God, would you break those, those patterns? Would you help us to see, see that we're actually a slave to sin because we're obeying sin more than we obey you? And then would you set us, would you set us free today? Would you help us to start to see sin like you see sin? That you would change our appetites and our desires and our focus. That you would help us to live pure and holy lives that bring honor to Christ. And so today, we wanna check our motives as we confess our sin. And then for those of you who have yet to receive Christ, the Bible says this, like you have a, you have a separation problem. And I'm gonna tell you how to solve the separation from God problem today. When you trust in the person of Jesus Christ, you solve the separation problem. And Jesus Christ brings you from enemy of God to friend of God. He brings you from being a slave to sin to being a slave to righteousness. He closes that separation gap so that you can draw close to him. And so if you're here and you're like, man, something's off in me. Like, I, I do feel distant. I, 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 I do feel like something's just not right. Like the core of who I am. I can tell you what it is. It's sin. Sin is always deceiving us and discouraging us and blinding us and leading us astray. Now, I'm telling you that God has solved that separation problem to his son, Jesus. And you can say yes to Jesus Christ today and boom, you're known by him, loved by him, in relationship with him. You become his child in that moment. And then, you, then you'll see to be like, oh my gosh, I can see, I can love, I can respond. That's what God does. He transforms us from the inside out. And so today, if you, if you have never placed faith and trust in the person of Jesus Christ, and you're like, you know, I, I feel really far away from God. I'm gonna lead you through a prayer right now where you can pray this prayer, mean these words in your heart. You can pray this prayer. And I'm gonna tell you that God, through his son, Jesus Christ, will come and live inside of you and will change you forever. So if you've never trusted Christ, I want you to pray this prayer prayer with me right now. God, I, I feel distant from you. I feel far away from you. I feel separated from you. And so today, God, I, I acknowledge my own sin. And I, I acknowledge my need for a savior today. And so by faith, I wanna trust in Jesus right now. So Jesus, would you come into my life? Would you forgive my sins? Would you fill my life with meaning and value and purpose and salvation? Would you change me? Would you fix me today? Not just my problems, but fix me today. Because I give my life to you. I draw close to you through your son. And I pray this in Jesus name. Amen. And so listen, if you, if you prayed that prayer today and you asked Christ to come into your life to, to solve the separation problem between you and God, that, that he would fix you, not just the problems around you, man, let me know, make your way to our prayer room to my right and your left so we can encourage you, celebrate with you, but don't pray that prayer and then just kind of wander off. Cause here's what the enemy will do. The enemy will try to discourage you with it. Not legit, not real. So let's verify it here today. 
Let's legitimize it here today by letting someone else know I trust it in the person of Jesus Christ. Amen? And so we're going to learn how to confess and take our sins seriously and be honest before God. And a lot of us, I thought a lot about this. There's so many of us, man, that, that besetting sin is like, here we are again, here we are again, here we are again. I sin, I confess, and then I sin again. And we gotta, we gotta break those patterns. And we can only do that by genuinely confessing and then repenting of our sins. And God wants to give you that freedom. He really does. He wants to give you that freedom today. And I will tell you, you'll be liberated when you kind of get through that, where you don't have to keep going back to those behaviors and patterns that lead you into bondage in the first place. Like no one wants that. None of one's want that for their life. And then today, if you've trusted in Christ, man, I, I'm, I'm so encouraged that uh, the gap, the separation has been closed and you know Jesus. And the day begins the first day of that eternal life for you. And so let's pray together. But you make sure if you need prayer today, man, go to the prayer room to my right and to your left. God, we thank you today that we can take our sin seriously, that we can see our sin the way you see our sin. And so would you help us to be real and honest today as a church? And for everyone here today struggling with besetting sin, Lord, that you would break through those chains that do bind us and keep us in bondage. And God, for those today who said yes to Christ, we thank you that you've fixed us at the core level of who we are, that we can know you. And so God, help us today. Fill us with your spirit today and use us today to advance your kingdom. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen.